Hello, everyone, and welcome to Schwab Coaching. My name is Cameron May, and this is Getting Started with Technical Analysis. And, you know, sometimes a stock can just skyrocket, but what might a trader look for on a chart to help in trading those sorts of rapidly moving stocks? Well, today we're going to be using a tool that's available on Thinkorswim, uh, known as the Fibonacci Retracements Tool, that's sometimes employed by traders who are trying to trade these rapidly moving securities. We're going to be talking about how it might be used for entries and exits. We're going to be placing an example trade. Should be a great discussion. But before we can get to any of that, let me first of all say hello to everybody that's already chatting in on YouTube. Great to see BJ and Naresh and Krishna, Chris, uh, Chad Nelson, Frank, Doug, everybody else. Thanks for joining us week after week in these discussions. We really, really do appreciate your ongoing attendance and your contributions. If you're here for the very first time, though, I want to welcome you as well. And if you're watching on the YouTube archive after the fact, enjoy the presentation. And of course, you're invited to join us in the live discussion that kicks off promptly 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on Tuesdays. So uh, with that said, uh, I also want to give a, a welcome to my very good friend, Lee Bowl, who's going to be hanging out there in the chats. Lee's role here. He's going to be monitoring the chats for any questions that are on topic, but that I can't get to just during the natural flow of the presentation. And he's going to be helping with those. So thanks for being there, Lee. And Lee and I would also like to extend an invitation to you. If you're not following us on Twitter or X, that's a great resource. Not everybody takes advantage of it. It's another resource you have uh, to have access to your favorite instructors. It's another educational resource. But yeah, follow us on X. Lee can be found at Lee Bowl, B-O-H-L-C-S. I'm found at Cameron May C-S. And if you reply to one of my uh one of my posts there on X, I try to reply right back to you. It allows us for more personalized interaction in between these webcasts, all right? But let's get into this. And as we do, of course, we need to pause, first of all, to consider the risks associated with investing. Risks are real. You need to be aware that any investment decision you make in your self-directed account is solely your responsibility. Having success with paper money account, uh, with a paper money account is not a guarantee that you're gonna have success with your real funds. As market conditions change and they can change rapidly, the information here is for general informational purposes only. It should not be considered an individualized recommendation or endorsement of any particular security chart pattern or investment strategy. Schwab does not recommend the use of technical analysis as a sole means of investment research, and investing involves risks, including the loss of principal. Okay, so let's get into discussing using Fibonacci's for trading stocks, all right? And as I do this, let me throw out the question here. How many of you are familiar with Fibonacci's? I'm looking and I see almost 100 people watching the live stream already. A lot of familiar names out there. I know a lot of you very well, uh, at least through our interactions on YouTube. So I know that a, a good number of you are going to be familiar with Fibonacci's, but there are going to be others who are not terribly familiar with these. So the first objective here, we're going to talk about how the Fibonacci tool is constructed. Then we're going to apply it to some charts and talk about how it might be used for the planning of a stock trade and, and especially for stocks that are really rocketing, okay? And then finally, we're actually gonna place an example trade. So pretty tall order, should be a great discussion. Let's get right to the Thinkorswim platform. Yeah, Chris says, yep. Arcelli says, not familiar. Great, I think you're gonna enjoy this. Although this is, of course, it's not a, pro a promotion of a specific tool, it's just an introduction. An introduction. Arcelli, CB, Naresh, Paul's a little bit familiar. Moose7496 says, nope. Okay, so let's go acquaint ourselves with something known as Fibonacci's, and as uh, Scott calls them, fibs. Yep, when I say fib, I'm not telling a lie. It is a reference to Fibonacci's. Okay, so let's use uh, Broadcom just as our, in, in our initial example stock. It has some examples of the sorts of behaviors that a Fibonacci trader might be looking for in employing this tool in the first place. So let's sort of turn our attention back here to uh, June of last year, okay? And the stock started to waffle around, not doing a lot, up and back and up and back. And then there was a real acceleration of price where the stock went from just over $800 to uh, about a thousand bucks, okay? Up $200, up about 20, 25% in a comparative eye blink. That was about, if we, if we put it in context of long-term stock trends, that was maybe two years worth of average productivity in an average stock portfolio in what, about three weeks? So here's a stock that's skyrocketing. And when that sort of thing happens with a stock, it can attract headlines, it can attract new potential investors like moths to a flame. 
But it's natural when something has already gone up sharply to ask questions like, well, should I be getting in right now? Or should a trader pause, wait for maybe some profits to be taken, and then look to get in after price has retreated a bit? A bit? And, if, and if they think that it might retreat a bit, how, how far down might they expect it to go? So let's use our Fibonacci retracements tool. Retracements means it means it's looking for these retreats in price following these big advances, okay? So it's one of our drawing tools. We can find it using the drawing tool menu right down here in the lower right corner. So right now I'm using my arrow, so it's gonna look like an arrow icon. That icon changes depending on which tool you've drawn. So if it's not, if it's not an arrow on your chart, that's what's going on. But let me click on that active tool and I'm gonna choose the one that looks like the big percentage icon. All right, so I'm going to select that, and let's just apply a fib to this advance right here. So this is how the tool is applied. We're going to apply it to the chart, then we're going to break down how it's constructed, and then we'll come back to it and talk about how it might be used to plan a trade. Okay, so let's go right to the top of a big up move. So Step number one is to identify a stock that has made a very strong move to the upside. Obviously, that's going to be left somewhat to the discretion of the trader. But this one, 200-point upswing over the course of a few weeks, let's qualify that as, a, as an apparently strong upward move. So then we go right to the top of that move. And once we've selected the Fibonacci retracement tool as our active tool, we click at the top of the move. And the sequence of clicks is important here. Okay, first click is gonna be at the very top of the move, including if there's a candle, like this one back here, including if there's a strong move to the upside. There are arguments on both sides of that. Um, in my experience, and that's you'll have to take that for anecdotal, uh, but uh, my experience has been that uh, most that I've encountered who use fibs go to the top of candles, not to the top of body of candles. Okay, but I'm gonna go to the top of that candle. In this case, there's not a huge distinction. Click there, there's our first click, and then go down and click again. Now, this is not a click and drag. It's a click once at the top, and then click again at the bottom, and that applies the tool to the chart, okay? And what, you're see, well, what you'll see here are a bunch of lines. And I may actually need to stretch my chart a little bit here so that you can see some numbers up here. Do you see those? When the lines are too close together, the numbers don't fit. So you can't see those. So I already know what those numbers are. So do, so do our uh, FIB traders here in the audience today. But I need to be able to see these numbers. So yeah, on thinkorswim charts, you can click on the right margin and just drag up and down. And it expands and contracts the vertical arrangement of the chart. All right. So we just did that. So we've applied our first FIB. Let's talk about what these numbers represent. Okay. Ken, you just asked, you're about to uh, ask, you're just about to ask if you start or stop at the Wix. Yep. Yeah. Again, there can be a difference of opinion on, on that. With technical analysis, there almost always is a difference of opinion on some point or another. Right. So let's, uh, let's come over here. And CL says, what's the difference between FIB ex retracements and FIB extensions? I think what I'll do in a future webcast, they're actually um, a series of Fibonacci-related tools. I'm just going to go through all of them quickly, explaining the differences. But this one, we're going to focus on FIB extensions. So if you don't mind, I'm going to park the discussion of that for now. Okay? But let's go to the left column. I'm going to open this up. And let's talk about where these lines are coming from. Okay? So all of these lines tie back to a concept in mathematics. It's also been borrowed by other scientific fields like biology, but it goes back to something called the Fibonacci sequence. And somebody gets to remind me because I was gonna look it up before the webcast to remind myself what the full name of the gentleman is who, for whom the Fibonacci sequence is named. Who was Fibonacci? Was it Leonardo Fibonacci? Something like that, I think that's right. Anyway, the sequence starts with the humble letter, uh, letter, number zero, okay? And then we just start progressing um, upward. Start with zero, move to one. Once we have those first two numbers, we add them together. Zero plus one is one, and that becomes the next number in the sequence. And then we take the last two letters or numbers in the sequence, add those to get two together, and we repeat that process, and it generates the entire sequence out, you know, ad infinitum. So one plus one is two, 
two plus one is three, three, uh, three plus two is five, five plus three is eight, and then we get what, 13, and then 24, and then uh, what are you up to now, 37? Let's make sure I get this right. Oh, no, I screwed up that one. Let's back up. Eight plus 13 is 21. Then we have 34, and we have 55 and 89, and on the sequence goes to 144, and I think you get the rhythm of that, okay? Yeah, so that is a sequence that, that really has no end. But um, that's known as the Fibonacci sequence, and then by looking at the relationships of the numbers within this sequence, mathematicians have found something that has, that has that's turned out to have important implications for all sorts of areas in science, okay? So the first thing, who asked about the golden ratio? It was Leonardo Fibonacci. Okay, great, BJ, thank you. Um, let's see, somebody asked about the golden ratio. Let's talk about the golden ratio. Okay, it's an important concept. What is the golden ratio? Well, it's been observed that if you take any number in this sequence and divide it by the number just before, so if we took 144 and we divided that by 89, and we can do that using our calculator right up here, 144 divided by 89 always produces 1.618. Now, as we get to very small numbers, it gets tends to vary from 1.618 precisely because they're, the numbers just aren't big enough to get precision from them. But as the numbers get larger, we just get more and more precisely dialed into 1.618, okay? Now, sharing the limelight also as the golden ratio is if we take, the, we take a number in the sequence and uh, divide the number just to the right of it, divide it by that number. So for example, if we just, just reverse things, if we take 89, divide that by 144, we get point. 618 or 0.618. So they sort of mirror numbers. But whether we're working with six, but, uh, 0.618 or 1.618, those turn out to be a pretty good mathematical description of all sorts of behaviors. For example, like in the natural sciences, if we study the arrangements of seeds within, within like a sunflower, if you were given the assignment to take a, a handful of seeds and cram them into a circular flower, uh, space or area, what you might discover is the best way to do that is to put that put them together in two concentric spirals that work together, and and the mathematical uh, relationship of the growth in those spirals happens to be one point six one eight, and we could apply that same logic to like the the way that the the chambers within a nautilus shell. I don't know if you know what a nautilus shell is. It's that sort of uh, spiral-shaped, snail-looking thing that squirts its way through the seas with the tentacles trailing out the back. Yeah, that's a nautilus. And if you slice the shell and lay it open, you may be seeing um, fossils of this. You'll notice that there are a series of concentrically growing chambers. And those chambers grow in sequence roughly according to the golden ratio. And that carries out into the way that uh, uh, they've discovered uh, similarities to, to the ratio in the way that um, the trees branch out and the ways that the leaves branch out from the branches and the way the veins within the leaves branch out from the leaves or from the stem. All of that can come back to this Fibonacci sequence and the ratios in it. Well, traders have also noted, hey, there may be a tendency here in the way that stock behaves that aligns with this. And, um, and other numbers can actually be derived from the Fibonacci sequence. And when assigned to a stock chart, it looks like they might play some importance in the way that price moves. Now, maybe they do or maybe they don't in future uh, behaviors on a, on a stock price chart. But you'll notice here that we already have some, some now familiar numbers. Here's 61.8 and we have 161.8. Now there are three numbers on this chart right now that are not included um, necessarily in Fibonacci. Now, zero actually is a Fibonacci number, but zero and 100 are actually just a description of the distance that the stock price traveled on the explosive move that's being measured. And then right in the middle of that is the 50% mark. 
in the in other words, it's the middle of that distance. Those are not explicitly Fibonacci sequence numbers, but that's what they represent. The rest are Fibonacci sequence ratio numbers. So for example, if we were to take any one of the numbers in this sequence and divide it by the number two spaces to the left, let's see what we get. We get 144. Let's say, let's take 144. Um, oh, pardon me, let's reverse that. It's a number in the sequence divided by a number two spaces to the right. Anyway, 55 divided by 144, what does that give us? 0.382. What do we have right there? 0.382, that's one of our Fibonacci sequence uh, numbers on our tool, okay? What if we take a number that's a little bit further away? How about we go to 34 and divide it by 144? 34 divided by 144, that gives us 0.236. Hey, what's right here? 0.236. So we've already gathered how almost all of these are calculated, and a lot of you know this. Now, I'm going to give extra bonus points if somebody can tell me, what's this oddball right here? 78.6. We've got 150, 38.2, 23.6, 0, 61.8, 161.8. What's this 78.6? To some technicians, this is sometimes seen as it's the most obscure number in the sequence. And, um, and for that reason, some see it as maybe the weakest when applied to a chart. This one is actually the square root of the golden ratio. Okay. So if we take 0.618 squared, look at that, 0.786. That's where that comes from. So that, that's the math behind the numbers. That's also the, the sort of the mathematical um, history of the tool and, and its application to other sciences and disciplines. Well, in the discipline of trading stocks, we just borrowed that from maybe the harder sciences and applied it to a chart to see if it has any application for the planning of a stock trade. And it turns out for some, they think that it might. Okay, so that's it. There's your lesson on the construction of Fibonacci's. Okay, BJ, you never knew that. You got to learn some more. Let me reset my chart here. I need to come back here, switch this back to auto because I had resized it vertically. This little tool right here gets us back to where it was before. Let's talk about the planning of a stock trade. So when a stock advances sharply. We've just talked through maybe the motivations of a trader who might be interested. Wow, here's a stock that's really on the move. I think, and again, I'm saying I as the hypothetical trader here, I think something intriguing is happening. Maybe I want to buy a stock. Can anybody think of any example stocks that are just skyrocketing right now? Maybe you've looked at it and thought, ooh, that thing is taking, taking off. Um, but Maybe I'm a little bit late to the game. Maybe I need to wait to pull back. All right, that's the sort of logic that these traders are, are applying to their chart. Well, what some have observed is that when a stock makes a strong advance like this, it's natural from some pro for some profit taking to occur. And that might be just what they're waiting for. They're waiting for some of those that already made a lot of money in a very short period of time to start taking some profits off the table. And they're and at least according to those who use Fibonacci's, there seems to be some consistent, some comparatively consistent um, proportions to how far down price retraces as those profits are taken. And uh, a very common objective here is to wait for when price has already started coming down. And so we do have to have to have, to have the patience here to wait for price to start coming down. Uh, commonly. And again, here, I'm going to mess up my chart again. Let's drag this open so you can see the numbers. There we go. But commonly, traders will look for price to come down between 61.8 and the 50 FIB level. Now, the concept there being that if something exciting is happening, but some people decide to take that as an opportunity to take profits off the table, hopefully not everybody takes profits off the table. That means we might be shifting into panic selling territory and the stock might collapse in price. But assuming there's some quote unquote natural profits being taken, um, how far down might that go? 
Well, about a third to about a half of the distance that was accomplished on its way up. So in this case, if we went up 200 bucks, maybe we'll pull back you know, between $65 and maybe 100 bucks. If it goes much more beyond that, the, a, a, a question starts to arise. Wow, maybe whatever it was that was exciting is a moment that has passed. The opportunity is gone and the enthusiasm has failed, right? But if it's just profit taking, hopefully we'll just come down to, you know, somewhere in that 61.8 to 50% range and start to rally again. That is a common application of a Fibonacci um, trade setup. Okay. Now for some traders, it's not, and I'll tell you in this case, it looks like uh, we ran up, pulled back, and boy, even as early as November 30th, price dipped down into that 61.8 to 50% range. For some traders, that's actually actionable right there. Now for those, they have to be comfortable with the fact that they may still be buying while, st while the stock price is still falling. For others, they see that as I'm trying to catch a falling knife. So they may wait for something else to develop and a, and a, a, a comparatively straightforward um, signal that price is starting to strengthen again is they might just wait for a white candle. So much like the one that we got here on December 1st. So if we were, let's say that we were just applying the logic of this entry, strong move up, waiting for a retracement between 61.8 and 50, or in other words, one third to one half of the, of the amount gained has now been surrendered. And we got a white candle. Has it turned out in this case that that was a pretty good entry? Yeah, in this case, it was not always going to be the case. Sometimes this is going to break down, no doubt. Okay. But yeah, there are other signals right through here that other traders may have taken. But yeah, I think that the first one for that more conservative group might have been there on December 1st. And you can see price traveled down a little bit further, but not much. If one is just trying to refine the uh, the entry that really couldn't have done a whole lot better in the, than, than in this example, right? So let's set that as our example entry. Well, now the trader, they have their signal for entry. How do they plan for exits? Well, the Fibonacci's may be useful for that as well. And there are, there are a few potential exits. The first, let's concern ourselves with if the trade fails, right? That, that's always a possibility, no matter how much homework we've done. Trade the, the logic of the trade could be invalidated by future price behavior. So with Fibonacci's, the trader may turn their attention not to a break below the 50% level, but actually down here to 38.2. I'm gonna lean on those who have used Fibonacci's before. This 38.2 line actually sometimes earns a nickname by traders, by these bullish traders who are looking for bullish entries and if the stock price doesn't rally from uh, between the 61.8 and 50, and instead it goes down to and closes below the 38.2, does anybody know the nickname that this sometimes has? That's sometimes referred to as the point of no return. Sounds dramatic. I didn't, that's not my nickname. That's just the, uh, the name that some technical traders apply. The concept there being that it's reached a tipping point where it's no longer, you know, just some quote unquote healthy or natural profit taking. And maybe now traders are no longer interested in whatever it was that got them excited in the first place. And maybe there's some news uh, or just abandonment of enthusiasm that's equal to the, the enthusiasm that caused the, the initial run up. Maybe we're just headed right on back down and going to surrender all those gains. Michael, you got it. Yep. Point of no return. Exactly right. Okay, so, so what might the trader do if we come down and close below the point of no return? Well, having gotten in within this range, assuming that we're likely to go up and we went the wrong direction, it might invalidate the reason for entry and they just pull the plug. Take whatever lumps. Yes, some trades result in losses. That's the way it works sometimes. So that's how the trade might be managed to the downside. Well, what about to the upside? Well, Fibonacci's actually generate potential price ceilings. 
And with the stock that's been moving sharply up, sometimes those ceilings can be hard to spot. Look over here. We're already above the 12 month highs. Like for example, there was a pretty good ceiling right through here, right? But we've broken through that. And now as we're entering again, where's the next ceiling? There's no really, there's no real technical historical evidence to tell us where that ceiling is. So this is where we get Fibonacci extensions. So here are retracements down here. Extensions are up above that, that can provide potential price targets or objectives for the trader who has taken an entry. All right, so there are a couple of potential um, what we call price targets. When we're taking an entry down here between 38 and, uh, be, pardon me, between the 61.8 and the 50, a first target level might be just to get back up to the previous highs, especially if there's a good distance that's been traveled on the way down. In this case, it was 100 bucks to get from this high down to that low. So just catching a swing back up to those highs may be enough for the trader to consider that to be adequately profitable and take profits off the table or, or even just starting to exit some of the position. Now others though, might wait for a move beyond this high, maybe up to the next anticipated cyclical peak. And that's where this 161.8 level comes into play. And all that's doing is assuming, well, if we got a one third retracement and started a rally, and we got an equally large move as the first move, where would that put us? Oh, it would put us right up here. So in other words, that's that's this, it's 100% of this move from the 61.8 level, okay? But that that is also a very common, either primary or secondary target, All right? So um, that's kind of the way that a, that a Fibonacci trader might structure an entire trade based on this sort of a technique and we're going to get some repetition with this, but before we do, I got to first of all say I've noted that there is there's been a link added to the chat window for the benefit of those who are here in the live discussion, and it's to give me some uh, comments via a short short survey. So if you would do me this favor, if you're in the live stream right now, click the survey link. That'll populate the survey on the screen. Then you can just park it to fill it out after the webcast is over. But it's a really short survey: two multiple choice uh, multiple choice questions a comments box and a suggestion box. And if you take the time to fill that out, my promise to you is that I always read through that data and I read through any comments that somebody chooses to leave, but that helps me prepare for future webcasts. It actually generates great ideas sometimes. So that's very much appreciated. It doesn't, your surveys don't just sort of disappear into the abyss. You know, who knows some manager in some back room seeing the data. No, it goes to, the, goes to those you would, who, would, who you would hope would see that information. So thanks for doing that. But back to the presentation here, um, there's our example fib. Let's get some more repetition with this, just using uh, Broadcom, okay? Let's just, because I wanna, I wanna show how this might play out, sometimes well, sometimes not so well. Let's clear our whole drawing set. Let's reset our chart here. Go up here to our price axis. Switch this to auto again. What I'm doing here is just fixing the fact that I've adjusted the scale of the chart. That's what that does. So here was that initial move, and then we pulled back. And then what happened again? And Trade and Growth says, what does FIB telling where will current pullback come to rest? Yeah, it does. That's one of the intended purposes of a, of a FIB, yes. So look at this move from the uh, first week of December. We get an explosive move to the upside, more excitement among traders of, of uh, Broadcom. Let's make sure that we've selected our Fibonacci retracements tool. How do we draw our Fibonacci for the purposes of planning a bullish stock trade? We go to the top, click once, move to the bottom, click again, and that, uh, that establishes where our price levels may turn out to be, okay? So in this case, where would the entry likely be? Well, a trader might wait for stock price to fall back down below the 61.8, landing hopefully between 61.8 and 50, not exceeding the, the uh, 38 level down here. And in this case, it didn't. And then we get a white candle. So possibly momentum returning to the stock after profit taking has occurred. That's the concept. And then the trader might start to structure their plan. And the plan might be from that point in, with a plan to exit if we slip down below and close below the 38 level, 
an initial potential target just up here at the 100, or we might wait and see if we can get up to 161.8. In this case, it, it panned out well. I will say the next one also worked out nicely. I removed this drawing. If I were to place you know, another fib right there on the next move to the upside, look at this. We pulled down between 61.8 and 50, rallied. There's the initial target. There's a second target. Worked out. Do they always? No. In this case, look at this move. Another very large move in a very short period of time. Over the course of just two weeks, we went from what was the low here? About 1,200 bucks up to about 1,440, 240 point swing, huge percentage move in a short period of time. So a FIB trader might be, you know, thinking, ooh, here's a nice setup. Click, click. And in this case, we got the move down into the 61.8, a pretty sharp rally, did actually ultimately get a white candle. So maybe they were waiting, thinking, here we go again. But what happened after that? Price sagged back and we've now closed below that 31.8. The stock is now behaving technically differently to our FIB trader. And this could change the way they approach this stock from, from here until things reverse again. Now, in this case, this might be an example of how a trade didn't work out. So don't get the impression that just because a stock has worked two or three times that it's absolutely going to work every time. Okay, let's get some uh, some more repetition with this. You know, one stock obviously has been getting a lot of headlines in this AI-driven environment, NVDA, right? This is a stock that has really been taking off. And if we look at this most recent, very large advance, let's zoom in on that. Let's apply a FIB here. Come down to our Fibonacci tool, make sure that that's the active tool. Go to the top, including the wick. Go down to the bottom where the where this move first started. This is interesting. This looks like a big, disappointing, bullish or bearish engulfing red candle. But to a Fibonacci trader, this may actually just look like the next entry signal for better or for worse from here. Obviously, time will tell how this plays out. But we just dipped our toe between the 61.8 and the 50 level, starting to rise again. Trader might plan, okay, here's our entry. Exit if we slip below 38.2, or look to maybe take some, some of the trade off here at the 100 level, or maybe even could this get up to the 161.8, or $1,167, that would be a, a quite a typical Fibonacci trade, okay? Switch that back to audio to resize this chart. So all of these examples have been for bullish trades. I will show, let me quickly show a quick example for a bearish trade scenario, although I'm not gonna you know, talk about strategies that might be employed at that point, but just to focus on the chart, um, can FIBs be used for the planning of bearish trades? Conceptually, yes. Let's switch over here to Alphabet. Let's say our, our, bullish, our previously bullish trader has been following Alphabet. Seems like it's been making higher highs and higher lows. But recently, uh-oh, broken trend line, and the stock has been accelerating downward recently. Could we conceptually apply a FIB to, to plan a bearish trade? Yes, but... The important difference here is the sequence of the clicks. All along, since we're planning bullish trades, we click at the top and then click at the bottom, and it fans out um, extensions or projections to the top side. Well, if we start our clicks at the bottom of a move, let's go down to the bottom of this move right here, okay? Click at the bottom, move toward the top, and click again. And I don't know, maybe you include this whole move right here. In any case, uh, whatever the trader identifies as the big move to the downside, click bottom to top in this case, and then we get the same Fibonacci distribution, but just in the opposite direction. So now you can see that there are projections for potential price targets down below. And in this case, let's see what, what we're doing right now. Looks like we've just crept above, yep, just crept above the 61.8 level, and we're now hovering between the 61.8 and 50. And for a bear, that might be just where they're looking for entry. It's also bumping right up against the previous trend line, 
just adding more technical evidence to the planning of a bearish trade. Is that going to work out perfectly for bears? We'll see, right? But that that might be the entry. Where might they feel a little bit stronger? Well, if we get a red candle going down, where might they plan to take profits? Well, back down here at these lows or possibly down there at those at this uh, Fibonacci extension. Where might they take their losses? Well, if we rally up above 50 and close, in this case, above the 38.2. Same logic as the bullish trades, just inverted. All right, so I think at this point, we're pretty comfortable with this. Let's actually do a trade. Let me look at a stock, Home Depot. It's had a, a bullish tendency for most of the year. You can see, is this a pretty large, let's say a disproportionately large move in a short period of time, proportionate to how the stock has been moving for the, through the course of the year? Yeah, it looks like an acceleration of a previously established trend. So let's go to the top here. There's the top of Home Depot's most recent move. Let's see where the excitement started. It looks like it was down here. And interestingly, where did we um, fall down to before reversing? Right down between 61.8 and 50. Tiny penetration of 50. Not at all discouraging for the trader who thinks the point of no return is still some distance below that. And we have a white candle. So let's say we have a plan to get in. We're gonna buy some example shares right now while the stock's trading at 375. Getting back up to 385, maybe the trader is planning to take some profits there. Let's go for the more distant target. It looks like that's more like 404 and a half, okay? So that's gonna become this example trades of uh, plan for taking profits, where do we take losses? Well, if we sag down below, in this case, the 38 levels at 366, let's call it 365. And just for, for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna round this off. I'm gonna round at 47 cents, we're gonna call it 405, okay? So 405 target, 365 stop. Let's go place our trade. $375 uh, stock, let's do 10 shares to a $4,000 trade. Go to our trade tab. Make sure that we have the correct stock queued up. And to place the buy order with both sell orders, we're gonna right click on our ask price on the Thinkorswim platform and go to custom buy order with an OCO bracket. That, that's gonna attach two sell orders to a buy order. So the first thing I'm gonna do is change each one of these to just, a, just 10 shares. And actually we can click on the broken chain link and that'll automatically change all of them to match our, our purchase order. I'm also going to submit this as a market order. This is, you know, obviously saying we're just willing to pay whatever it takes to get into this trade. Now, that might mean we have to pay more than we planned. We'll see. But let's put in our, our target price first, and that was at uh, 405, right? That's going to be our limit order. Yeah, I know it was 404.53. Let's change that to 405 just for convenience purposes. 405. Make that a good till cancel order. We're saying here, we don't want to sell for less than 405. That's our limit. That's a, that the least we'd want to sell for, unless the stock is falling. If it falls down to 365, we want to stop the bleeding, get us out of this trade. Let's make sure that both of those two sell orders are good till canceled. That'll give it six months for this trade to play out. See if we can get it done, done in that much time. But uh, in any case, this is a, an OCO order, meaning if we wind up buying those shares and we're putting in a market order, high probability we're gonna get the order filled pretty quickly. Either the stock is eventually gonna work its way up to 405, we sell for 405 and then the stop is canceled or it works its, day, its way down to 365 or below and the stop is triggered and filled and then the limit order is canceled, okay? Well, let's. Click confirm and send, but the OCO means one cancels the other. Buying 10 shares of Home Depot, target 405, stop at 365. This is not a guarantee. With stop orders, there's no guarantee that the execution price will be equal to or near the activation price of 365 here. With market orders, prices can change quickly in fast market conditions, resulting in execution prices that can be different from the quotes displayed at order entry. We're not guaranteed a price at, at or around 375 if markets are moving rapidly. So let's. Uh, there's not a commission on this trade, but there can be on some types of trades. Send that off, and we just bought some Home Depot. 
skyrocketing stock, relatively speaking, um, using Fibonacci's to plan that trade. So we've done what we set out to do today. We got an introduction to how they're built, how they might be applied to a stock chart, and we got some repetition on both sides, bullish and bearish. So that's quite a bit. Hope you enjoyed that, guys. Time for me to let you go, but I do want to give you the reminder that you have other resources outside of these webcasts. Two requests, I'm, I'm going to tack on a third request, but suggestions. Please do follow me on X, follow Lee Bowl on X. It's a great resource. Not everybody takes advantage of it. It doesn't cost anything. So Lee can be found there at Lee Bowl CS. My handle is right there on your screen, at Cameron May CS. And it is the best place to connect with me in between these live streams, okay? Now, the other thing is, if you're enjoying these webcasts, make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Go down and click on the subscribe button if you haven't done that already. You can find it down below the display window or down in the lower right-hand corner of, this, of the display screen. You can see a little blue or gray subscribe button. Click subscribe. That'll give you notifications of when new videos are released. And also, YouTube is a great place to find the playlists of previously delivered webcasts organized by topic, and you can find our live streams as well, okay? All right, now I said there's gonna be a third request. Yep, time to fill out that survey. So if you wanna click that link and have that ready to fill out, I'd very much appreciate it, but also thank you very much. 153 people watching all the way to the end here. 43 people have already clicked the like button on YouTube. That's very much appreciated. If you're here in the live stream, click the like button. It sounds like applause to me. It's really appreciated. It helps our video in the YouTube algorithms as well, which is great. Helps us find a, a wider audience. If you're watching on the archive, hope you enjoyed the webcast. Click the like button. That is also, uh, it also helps as well. And it's noticed. I go back and look at those likes. It tells me, you know, which topics are well received. Thanks, everybody. Go enjoy the rest of our educational offerings through the rest of the day. I will see you again tomorrow for another webcast. I'll also look for you on X, but uh, whenever I see you again, until that moment arrives, I wanna wish you the very best of luck. Happy trading. Bye-bye.